We are honored this year to have Dr. Joseph Stoll as the featured speaker for the Nathan Meyer series. Dr. Stoll serves as president of Cornerstone University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Internationally recognized conference speaker, Joe has written numerous devotionals for Our Daily Bread and several books, including The Trouble with Jesus, Simply Jesus and You, and Redefining Leadership. Has a distinguished career in higher education and church leadership. He served as senior pastor at Southgate Baptist Church, Bible Baptist Church, and Highland Park Baptist Church. From 1987 to 2005, he served as president of Moody Bible Institute. Following his time at MBI, he served as the teaching pastor at a church in suburban Chicago prior to assuming the presidency at Cornerstone in early 2008. Hard to believe it's been since 2008. Dr. Stoll is a graduate of Cedarville University and Dallas Theological Seminary and was honored with the Doctor of Divinity degree from the Master's College in 1987 and Huntington University in 2011. He and his wife, Marty, are the parents of three adult children and 10 grandchildren. We are also honored to have Marty here this week. And so as Dr. Stoll comes forward, let's give both of them a welcome. Thank you so much, Mark, and good morning. And our congratulations to the award recipients. How special that um, your gifts and the stewarding of your gifts have been so wonderfully recognized. Well, this week, um, we've been talking about biblical principles that help us navigate toward effective ministry. And yesterday, we talked about embracing a whole different identity. If I were to ask you who you are, you would say, if you were here yesterday, you'd say, thanks, Joe, for asking. I am a follower of Christ. And that is a transformative identity. Working in Christian higher ed, I see a lot of schools, maybe even Dallas, say, send us your students and we'll make leaders out of them. Which, by the way, gives 80% of the people break out in a cold sweat because they're not gifted to be <laughs> leaders, right? <laughs> but I think it's far more important to have students come and learn to be followers of Christ because that will advise your leadership to success. Today, we want to talk about expectations. I remember asking a friend of mine who's in the counseling business, uh, what are the, what's the short list of the core problems that bring people into your office? Uh, as a preacher of the Word of God, I like to know what those basic deep things are, because maybe we can address those as we help lead people toward healing in Christ. And so he gave me his list. And a couple of them I could have probably written, but one was a surprise. It was broken expectations. But as I thought about it, you know, we come into life with great expectations, don't we? And then they don't turn out, and they implode in front of us. And we become disappointed, and then the disappointment uh, moves into discouragement and maybe depression and despair. And, and so I suddenly realized that expectations are a big deal, and they're a big deal to God. God even talks to us about them. And I think for all of us going into ministry, um, you know, we just come with the expectations that some, some time, given my amazing gifts, I'll be in a great place. Like Chuck Swindoll is aging. <laughs> there will need to be a, a replacement, you know, and when people recognize me, you know, that'll be my place. And, but you don't mind starting out in a little church because you know that eventually, you know, you'll be catapulted and <laughs> only to find out that 20 years later, you're still in that little church. Nobody's asked you to speak any place. You didn't write any books. You don't have a radio program. In fact, the only speaking invitation you get is to the annual devotional for the Volunteers for Jesus women group in your little church. And suddenly the disappointment begins to settle in, and it can be very damaging. Or I think maybe we come into ministry with this expectation that once people know how charming I am, I'll be really affirmed, and I'll have all the applause, and I'll have all the encouragement, only to discover there's a lot of lame people in this world. 
that partner you're working with on the mission field who it's hard to get along with. That in the church you pastor, there's a lot more critics than cheerleaders. That people are not all you expected them to be. And you find out you're stuck in a bad place with really lame people. And inevitably, the damage to your soul and your spirit begins to implode the work of Christ through you. So maybe we ought to talk about this. I find it interesting that in Philippians chapter 1, Paul finds himself in a very bad place with some really weird people. And the thing that surprises me, instead of him being in despair, he is actually ecstatic. He's rejoicing. He's on top of it all. So maybe we can find the secret in this text. Philippians chapter 1, his testimony begins in verse 12. He writes, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me... Okay, here's a Wednesday morning quiz. How many of you know where he's writing this from? Prison, right? So he's in prison in Rome. And he says, I want you to understand what's happened to me, actually know what's happened to me. They know what's happened to him. I'm thankful that the Greek word is bigger than just knowledge of facts. It really can mean to understand. And I think... When you and I hit a wall in life, I mean, you know all the facts, right? And you'll tell everybody all the facts of your problem over and over again. The issue is not, do you know what's happened to you? Do you seek to find the hand of God? Do you under, can you understand what God is doing in the midst of that difficulty? So he wants them to understand this. I want you to understand, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, I couldn't wait to get to this point to take you to the closing of the book when he signs off in chapter 4. Brace yourself. In chapter 4, he ends the book by saying, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Really, like, the gospel's gotten into Caesar's household. There are saints in Caesar's household. How does that happen? Now, I want to be careful not to uh, wander off into exegetical guessing here. So if you'll be a little patient, I just wonder. This is, I wonder. So he's being guarded by the imperial guard. How many of you think they've guarded some pretty sleazy people? <laughs> Probably. So I just imagine the guard saying to Paul, hey, dude, what's a guy like you doing in a place like this? And Paul goes, don't ask. I do not want to talk about this. I'm in this big divine bait and switch moment in my life. God called me to be the global apostle with all the authority and leverage. And now he's shrunk my world, right? Now I'm sitting in prison. I don't want to talk about this. No, he says in the text that they all know that I'm here for Christ. So I think maybe Paul might have said, if I can keep wondering about this, well, thank you for asking. I'm here because I was preaching, as Acts tells us, the resurrection of Christ in the synagogues. That's an oral culture, right? Who is guarding the tomb of Christ? The imperial guard. And think about in their armor, they're there. And all of a sudden, they're struck like dead men. The stone is rolled away. They kind of come to, and there's angels. And my guess is that might have gotten back to Rome. And so he said, let's say that he says to the guard, you know, I'm here because I was preaching the resurrection of Christ. The guard says, hey, I heard about that. And Paul unfolds the gospel for him. And he accepts Christ and he goes back and tells his buddy, I'm guarding this guy who knows everything about what happened in Jerusalem. Take my shift. You got to hear him. <laughs> I mean, I'm just wondering because the gospel has invaded Caesar's household and God, in the midst of putting him in a really bad place, has opened up a whole new mission field. Shocking for him. So I wonder, 
if it ever crossed your fallen little brain, that just maybe God has put you in that place you're in on purpose for a purpose. So pastor in a little tiny town in south southern Michigan, those of us from Michigan do the hand trick here, little farming village, 1,000 people. He pastored the First Baptist Church of Colon, Michigan. Pastored there his whole life. Rarely was there more than 100 people in church. And a little boy in his church accepted Christ, and he mentored that boy, and that boy admired him. That boy came from generations of farmers, but so admiring this Pastor White, he decided to go to college, and he wanted to become a pastor himself. And he became an outstanding pastor, pastoring major churches, was a denominational leader, impacting tens of thousands of people. And that man's my dad. And whatever opportunities the Lord has given to me to speak his word and to share the good news and my children who are in ministry. And it all started with one pastor who nobody ever knew his name, never had the limelight, who faithfully knew that God had put him in that place on purpose for a purpose. How do you know that in that little place, maybe it's your own children who see your character and grow up to do something for God great and expansive in the next generation? I don't know, but I just know that God puts us in places on purpose and for a purpose. Well, if the place doesn't get you, count on it, the people will. All right? (laughs) So he goes on to say, verse 14, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word, word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. But the former proclaim Christ out of a spirit of competition, not with sincerity, but thinking to afflict afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only in every way I'm praying that God would take them out. (laughs) That was amazing. So what? Literally, the Greek is like, so what? Christ is being preached, and in that I do rejoice. And I'm just thinking about these Roman believers who do not like Paul, and they are so do not like Paul, they actually want to add affliction to him while he's in prison. And I'm going like, (laughs) I wonder why. Maybe like they're going like, Paul, 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 that's all we ever hear about in churches, Paul, Paul, Paul. We're so tired of hearing about Paul. Or maybe they're going like, hey, I've written a few letters myself. How come nobody's reading my letters in church? (laughs) But so here he is stuck with these lame people who are warring against him. As I was reading that text about Christians in rivalry and competition, I was so thankful that that all stopped at the end of the first century. (laughs) Well, obviously, we know better than that. These demons within us of competition, wanting to have the better church, wanting to be more recognized, wanting to be on top of the heap, wanting to have the limelight. And none of us are exempt. I don't know why it is that we don't know that God called us not to compete against each other, but go arm in arm against the gates of hell but we're not exempt. Uh, This demon dwells within all of us, and I have to admit, often I find that demon intruding my own spirit, my own soul. I remember pastoring a church, and on the other side of town was a church a little different, but basically the same. The same gospel, the same doctrine, everything. Except... They would run their buses around town. They had this, they'd pick up kids in neighborhoods on their buses for Sunday school. Great idea. 
They were so aggressive, they'd pull into our parking lot. And when kids got out of the cars, we, not really, but almost that aggressive. <laughs> and on the side of their bus, they called themselves the fastest growing church in our town. Do you think that bothered me? That bothered me. Because if they were the fastest growing church, they were the best church, which meant that our church was not the best church. That bothered me. Now, I remember one Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, they decided to break all their attendance records. So they decided to have Friends Sunday. And uh, it was a relatively small town, so some of the people in our church were friends of their people in their church. Do you think that bothered me? <laughs> that bothered me. And then they decided to give a prize for whoever brought the most friends. I'm going like, that's really cool. Like, prizes for routine faithfulness? That bothered me. <laughs> what made it worse, they decided to entice all the kids in town to come and throw an Easter egg hunt on the front lawn. I'm going, this is really amazing. We are now celebrating the pinnacle of redemptive history by painted eggs under bushes, hunting for eggs. They really, that bothered me. I'll never forget that Sunday night, uh, back when we used to have Sunday night services, uh, being at the drinking fountain, and I just felt somebody, you ever felt people invade your space? Like, and I looked up, and this lady's making this beeline for me. And I stood up probably with like water dripping down my chin. I, and she said, Pastor, do you know how, and she named the church, do you know how many they had there this morning? I said, no, how many? She said, and we're a small town, this was spectacular. We had, they had 1,500 people there this morning. And do you know what bothers me? She said that some of the people there were our people and they should have been in our church. She's going on and on like, I'm normally not this good. But I've been reading this text. And when she took a breath, I mean, I could hardly get in, you know, but <laughs> when she took a breath, I said, you're kidding me. Are you telling me in our little town this morning that 1,500 people heard the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I tell you, that was a showstopper right there. That was like, that was a showstopper. But that's where Paul was. This is an unbelievable story. There's a little struggling church in Atlanta with an unknown pastor by the name of Andy Stanley. <laughs> and Andy, Andy tells his story that when they outgrew their facilities, they needed to find acreage on the perimeter of Atlanta and they looked all around Atlanta and finally found the perfect location. And so they bought it. And he admits that one struggle he had in his spirit, there was a little vineyard church just down the street. But it was the only place where they could buy property. And so they began to flourish. Parking lots were jammed, traffic jams. And he said, I walked into my office one day and there's a callback slip from the pastor of this little church. He said, I did, <laughs> I did want to call him back. I thought I'm going to get what for for invading his territory. But I did call him. And when I called him, the pastor said, thank you for calling me back. I want you to know that for the last 10 years, we have been praying that God would reach this part of Atlanta, and you are the answer to our prayers. Can that be? He said, I notice your parking lots are full. Ours aren't. Do you want to use our lot? And by the way, I know you're busy. Would you ever come and preach at my little church? Sheep stealing moment, right? Could it be that one person understood that we're not here to compete with each other and that if Christ is preached, in that we do rejoice? So how does Paul pull this off? Being in a really bad place with some really lame people, how is he so ecstatic? So keep reading in the text, because here's the secret. He says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, I know how I listen to messages. I'm in, and I'm out, and I get back in, and I get out. Do I have a witness on this? <laughs> so if you're out, you've got to get in right now. 
because here it is. As it is my eager expectation that in nothing I will be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. One pressing expectation. How many of you think that Christ can be magnified through you in a really bad place? Or around some really weird people? The thing I love about this expectation is that broken expectations, are, we're victimized by them. You know, we, we can't help ourselves because it's what other people do to us. This is one expectation I can be fully in control of. And the Greek word here really, your Bibles may say honored. The Greek word literally means magnified, to make Christ large. To take this invisible, internal Jesus and let him flow, flow out of your life that you see people see the, the amazing love of Jesus, his justice, his righteousness, his mercy, no matter who, where you are or who you are with, you have the opportunity to magnify the reality of Christ through your life. And you're always in charge of that. And certainly that was happening with him in prison. It was happening in the evangelism of Rome. When I was a kid in my wasted youth, <laughs> uh, we used to uh, call the local store. This is back when some of you probably are, have, are clueless now. Mark Bailey is old enough to know this, but for the rest of us. <laughs> but they used to sell tobacco in little red cans called Prince Albert, right? And so we would call the local store. And we would say, do you have Prince Albert in a can? And it was, well, yes, we do. And we'd say, well, let him out. And then we'd hang up. <laughs> so I came all the way from Cornerstone University to ask you this question. Do you have Jesus in your heart? Then let him out. Magnify him. No matter where you are. No matter who you're with. Let them see the reality of the multifaceted, rich character of Jesus Christ through you. That's the expectation. But it's not always easy. I remember several years ago, back when I was in pastoring, I was pastoring in a little town called Kokomo, Indiana. And I was asked to speak at a conference up in Michigan. And so I called the local travel guy, and I asked him, do we have a plane that flies from what we affectionately call the Kokomo International <laughs> Airport? <laughs> and he said, yes, we actually was in Grand Rapids where I was going. Actually, he said, we do. It starts in Indianapolis, stops in Kokomo, stops in South Bend, and ends up in Grand Rapids. I said, book me. So he did. And as he was booking me, he said, by the way, this plane doesn't have a lot of instruments. It's just a little tiny plane. So if the weather's bad, it might not land. So I'm the eternal optimist, you know, like, <laughs> fine, book it for me. The morning came, I grabbed my luggage, got in the car, I noticed that the cloud ceiling was a little low and never thought anything of it and walked into the airport where, by the way, interestingly enough, the ticket taker, the baggage person, and the air traffic controller are all the same person. <laughs> So I walked up, handed him my bag. He started filling out the paperwork. He said, by the way, the weather's not all that great. We don't know if we can get this plane down or not. I had to be there at 11 o'clock that morning. That's when the meeting started. Well, I find that my sanctification gets to really low points at airport counters. <laughs> so I started working the guy. I'm going, dude, you've got to get it down. I'm speaking to 1,000 people at 11 o'clock this morning. You've got to get the plane down. You've got to get... He said, all right. And then just before my eyes, he morphed into the air traffic controller, like, whoa. <laughs> and he starts talking to the pilot. And I can hear them talking to each other. The pilot's saying, I'm not sure I can land this plane because of the weather. And I'm talking, tell the pilot he's got to get this plane down. And I heard the engines got louder and louder. And then they got softer and softer. And I heard the pilot say, I'll give it one more try. Now I was really on this guy. 
you got to get it. He turned to me and said, look, people on that plane have to live. I was like, <laughs> going like, I don't care. Get that plane down. And I heard it get louder and louder, and then I heard it get softer and softer, and I, I heard the pilot say, we're on our way to South Bend. I saw, and the ticket baggage air traffic control guy <laughs> said to me, you're a minister, aren't you? <laughs> oh, gee, like, <laughs> they'd put the Reverend Joseph M. Stoll on the ticket. I said, yeah. He said, then God will take care of you. So annoying. <laughs> he gave me my suitcase back and I started walking. I remembered that an attorney in the church I pastored flew for a, a hobby. And not in retrospect, not any coincidence, three weeks earlier, he had said to me, hey, pastor, if you ever want to go anywhere, let me know. He said, I'd be glad to fly. Boom, I got him up. I, he woke him up. I told him my sad story. He said, I'll meet you at Hangar 9 in 15 minutes. And he, I don't know. This is what the Lord has done. Thank you, Lord. And I picked up my bag, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw this ticket baggage air traffic control guy, and I was so ashamed. Paul said that in nothing I'm ashamed, that Christ will always be magnified. I was so ashamed, because I had missed a major opportunity. Think how different it would have been if I would have said to him, really, you don't think you're going to get this plane down? I said, well, you know, my life has been in the Lord's hands like for a long time, and he kind of controls my agenda. So if that's what happens, I'm sure he'll have another plan. But get the plane down. <laughs> Just think if I had said that and was able then to walk over to him and tell him the story of what the Lord had done. But I woke up that morning with one pressing expectation, and it was to get to Grand Rapids. How different my day would have been if I woke up that morning saying, today, wherever I am, or whoever I am with, I will seek to magnify Christ. Just think how different your day would be if every morning you woke up, regardless of where you are, who you're with, that you would seek to magnify Christ. And now I know why it says next in the text, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. So write it down. Take all your expectations, write all of them down, put them in some vessel somewhere and light them on fire. <laughs> and throw the ashes away. And then get the post-it notes out. Wherever I am, whoever I'm with, I will magnify Christ. Stick it on your fridge, stick it on your mirror, stick it on your dashboard, stick it on your forehead. It's a marvelous expectation. God bless you. <laughs>